Welcome to Untriggered, brought to you by psychodynamic coaches and parents of three, Andrew Lynn and Lavinia Brown. Together we normalize and unpack common challenges faced by couples and parents, explore how these could be symptoms of unprocessed trauma, and support you with the tried and tested tools for you to show up as the mum and dad, partner, and person you deserve to be. Welcome to Untriggered. Today we're going to talk about how not to get divorced, how conflict can show up in relationships and how it's often nothing to do with the person you're with and much more about unprocessed stuff that you are still carrying and projecting onto the other person. Yeah, I mean, we've certainly experienced it in our own relationship and we see it with our clients. And actually, it's my belief that there aren't really any marriage problems that are specific to marriages, but they're all childhood problems for married people. So we're going to discuss a bit about that today. So the way that this shows up a lot in my clients is women feeling that their partners haven't committed enough. It's definitely something that we went through together. I felt that Andrew wasn't committed enough for a long time and pestered him and pestered him and badgered him and badgered him and he just didn't he didn't get it right you didn't get it you thought that well you kept saying to me I've given you three kids what more do you want we live in a house together what more do you want and I was like no you know that you're not getting it this is about I don't feel you I can't feel you I don't feel that you're on my side I don't feel like you're my team yeah there are a couple of things from my point of view number one I had commitment issues, which is pretty common, uh, which are probably linked to like a fear of rejection, fear of commitment. But also I was committing to you as much as I could in that point in time. But I was committing to you mentally, not necessarily from within my body. And I could feel that. Exactly. I could feel that you weren't embodied, that you weren't present. So I wanted more. And that was a massive cause of tension. We ended up going to see a marriage counsellor who was really unhelpful, actually, because I remember every time we saw her, we'd come away and everything had been stirred up, but there were no practical solutions. There was no look at the layer beyond the superficial communication. And that's, I think, why we're talking about today, because this is so much about attachment trauma. It's about probably me needing more commitment because I didn't get it from my parents. I didn't have that sense of safety and grounding from my parents. And therefore I was looking for it. But to be honest, I was looking for it from every boyfriend I ever had from, you know, teenage years. I remember thinking for me, it wasn't so much the boyfriend I was attracted to. It was the, the family. I immediately started fantasizing about being part of this guy's family so I know that I was definitely projecting a need to feel safe and to belong and to feel important to feel worthy you know to feel worthy of committing to mm. I think that's it which is why we ended up nearly getting married this year but not getting married but I at least got you to the place where you wanted to get married which was kind of enough I think everyone deserves that level of commitment. That is that is quite natural. The problem is when you need it, it's probably least likely to come. Because as somebody who's scared of commitment, that desire from you, you can almost feel that. So it's, it, it makes you put up a boundary if you've got commitment issues. Mm. And in some ways, that's the, the kind of the yin and the yang of us and why we got attracted to each other. Yeah, exactly. So this is going back to the the topic of today. You will either pick someone that feeds your wounds or heals your wounds. And not everyone is capable of healing each other's wounds. I've been married before, for example. I don't think I was ready in any way to perhaps even accept my wounds, accept that they were there or to look at them. I just, I wasn't, I was too young. I wasn't emotionally mature enough. So maybe that relationship had the potential for that, but I, it didn't happen for whatever reason. This relationship, perhaps because we had children, 
the children were the glue that enabled us to push on through that, I don't want to look at this, so that we did end up healing each yeah. other's wounds. But it's, a, it it's not was, easy. It certainly was for me. And I think the point is that whatever unconscious wounding brings you together as a couple, it's going to come up. You're going to have to face it. And it's either going to make your relationship or it's going to break your relationship. Yeah, totally. But the most important thing is, I think, the the crossroads really is that the people that it breaks their relationship are the people where it remains unconscious and you blame that other person. So you're not committing to me enough or I'm angry with you or you're not doing enough. You're basically not healing me. You're not giving me what I need when it's not actually that person's job to give you what you need. Yeah. So you have to go back to, as I always say, being able to give yourself what you need from within. Yeah. And for both of us, that means inner parenting, reparenting that child that didn't get the safety, the love, the validation that she needed from her parents. That's where it should come from. And instead, she has to get it from you. So that's obviously what we teach people to do in my Making Peace With Your Past online program. And you do that one-to-one. So reparenting your inner child is always an option. That's how we resource ourselves from within. But until we realize that we need to be resourced, we are going to look for that in another partner. So it's really about understanding when your reaction is a trigger, when your reaction is disproportionate. So as Andrew said, When you need something from that, so I needed commitment, I needed to feel that he was present, did that have a manic energy around it? Did that have a kind of urgency? If you need someone to change for you to feel okay, then you know that it's not you that needs it. It's your inner child who is looking for something that she didn't get in childhood. If you are looking for something such as more help around the house, something like your partner doesn't ever put out the bins or doesn't help with bath time and it doesn't have that urgency that 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 visceral physical sensation then that's that's not necessarily a wound that's just you need more support and you need to ask for it in the right way so i think a good way of knowing oh how do i know if it's my inner child that's needing this thing it's because it's visceral it feels urgent it feels manic it feels like you have to have it you have to change that person And the only part of you that ever needs to change someone is your inner child. Yeah, I think it's about taking responsibility. Coming from a a starting place of, you know, everything in my reality, not just my partner, but every part of my experience is a reflection of me. Right, so if there's something that's dysfunctional or if there's something that's causing me to be triggered or like you said there's a manic there's a there's a disproportionate reaction to the situation then I know there's a trigger I know there's something that's bigger than me I know I've been hijacked in that moment and we can only be hijacked by repressed emotion because that's what happens the the emotions triggered and suddenly we are a different person we're not reacting from presence which means our inner child is around, right? And most people we were when we got together and a lot of the people we work with, most people are part adult and part inner child trying to have an adult relationship. And that just doesn't work because in times of stress, in times of conflict, it's the inner child that comes out and starts running the show. And that's really what leads to divorce, this kind of not being able to get above that staying in the unconscious staying in the inner child staying in the conflict rather than recognizing oh this is what we're doing yeah so you need to be able to recognize number one the kind of charge around your feelings your need for things to be different people call it a trigger people say i'm triggered trigger charge yeah that manic feel that visceral sensation that's what you want to look out for is that there if so it's probably not you but it's your inner child in the driving seat Secondly, how do you approach it? Well, you look at what it is that you need. What is my wound? How does this relate to what I didn't get 
as a child. That's why we talk about attachment trauma. Attachment should be secure. It should be your parents attuning to your physical, emotional needs. They should be aware of your nonverbal cues and ready to acknowledge your verbal cues of, of what you need. Many parents aren't able to do that. It's not, it's, it's not that straightforward. I mean, it should be a lot more straightforward, but many of our parents' generation just didn't have that emotional maturity. They had their own trauma and they had their own baggage. So they weren't able necessarily to attune to us. That will cause attachment trauma in that the, the attachment isn't secure. It's unpredictable. It's conditional and you behaving well or behaving in a way that your parents deem worthy of affection and love. So working out what is it that I am lacking that I recognized from my childhood. In me, like I said, I think I never, I had plenty of conditional love. I had lots of conditional love, but dependent on me performing in the way that my parents wanted me to perform. So I wanted, having chosen a partner, I wanted unconditional love. I wanted to feel worthy in my worst moments, when I looked shit, when I was acting crappy, when when I was when I was vulnerable because having had three kids with someone, you've shown someone, you know, you, you, well, there's nothing that, more vulnerable. That was like the first few months of our relationship where you were basically saying, this is the worst of me, right? Are you going to hang around? <laughs> yeah, we had lots of these crazy drunken experiences and these big arguments that flared up and you would kick me out of the, the house and you would send me away to see if I would come back. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, it worked and I came back. Um, We won't talk about how you punched a hole in my wall. No, let's not talk about How I threw a computer down the stairs. That's my fight or flight. I I was going into fight or flight. When I thought that you were conditionally there for me, I I go into fight or flight and I, I fight. So, yeah. You did see my worst side. Uh, But going back to how you deal with it, it's about understanding, yeah, what were you lacking in childhood? So what do you think you were lacking when you said, so I I know that I needed stability and unconditional love. What do you think was causing your commitment issues? If I look at the high level trauma, my experience, I think there was... A few things. There was a a decent foundation of self-love, which I got, but I got it mixed with like the ultimate rejection, which was my parents' divorce, which I perceived, as every child does, as a personal rejection. So I had this kind of love from a lot of people in my family, my grandmother, my mother, their aunts, a lot of this kind of maternal love, like, oh, you're amazing, all this stuff. And then I had my father through whatever, for whatever reason, who left and was pretty absent. So I, that, that conflict is really, really hard to, to process as a child. So how did that relate so, to you not wanting to commit? Well, scared of committing? it led to me not committing in pretty much every area of my life because the fear of rejection was the the yeah the un the unconscious fear of rejection was the strongest thing. So that unconscious belief that I don't want to feel that again. So if I get committed, if I get too successful, if I get too wealthy, if I get too much love, if I get too much happiness, then I can lose that, right? So you end up protecting, you end up pushing people away, or you end up staying one foot in and one foot out. It's weird, right? Because you had, we have three children, and you kept saying, but I've given you three children. And I was like, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> so what? I know you fathered three children, but that doesn't mean that you're committed to me. And then you would say, but I chose you to have my three children with. That wasn't enough for me. So that was... But I was committed as much as I could be before I healed that wound. 
And that's so the key how do thing. You heal that wound. That's the key thing. I was committed in my head. I was committed to you. We had children, but the conscious doesn't run the show, right? The inner child runs the show. The unconscious runs the show. So I was always fearful of the rejection or the commitment or whatever it was. So energetically, I was pulled back from you, and you could feel that. Hugely. So I had to go through the process, the process of investigating, healing, processing the emotion, be turning up for myself uh, and my inner child the way my father couldn't. Yeah. So you ended up giving yourself that unconditional acceptance which you had projected onto your dad as being rejection of who you were. I worked on creating safety and, again, unconditional acceptance of myself so that I didn't need you to provide it for me. Exactly. And there's no other way to do it. I couldn't get that from you. You can't... Because it wasn't actually... It wasn't me that was scared so you couldn't like we're interacting in the present moment you can't say i love you i'm going to stay with you you're going to be fine to heal my wound my rejection wound because it's my inner child that's scared of rejection it's not me i'm committing to you as a man as much as i can but i've got a fragmented inner child that's running the show and you can't heal my inner child Mm. and actually nobody can heal my inner child I need to heal my inner child. Yeah. And that goes back to your first point. Like how how do you navigate through challenges in relationships and marriage? And you have to take responsibility. You have to do the work yourself. Yeah, and grow as people. That's the only way you can do it. Yeah, totally. So that is how we overcame that particular wound that we were drawn together to heal and because we recognized that it was there we were able to overcome it and move forwards as a couple yeah but it wasn't easy there were breaking points and i think this is quite important to talk about because it turns up quite a lot in our clients and that you led the way a lot of the time in this work right you sought out help Mm. you were like we got a problem here this isn't good enough for me. This isn't enough. And that's actually something I'm going to say. So many of my mom and clients feel like they're in the wrong for pointing out the negative, but actually they're not. Women have the capacity, I would say, to see the potential, the full potential in something. We want something to be amazing. We want it to be fulfilling and you know, sexually, emotionally, physically, mentally, that we want the whole works. And I don't think that's unrealistic. It's not like we're asking for Cinderella or anything. But we we see the potential in ourselves and our partners and our children. I don't know whether we're wired differently or something. But that can come across badly if we point that out in terms of you need to or you have to, which is a communication issue. 100%. 100%. Often it's like, you need to, I need. That whole need word is not a good one. It's about recognizing, okay, yeah, you do need, you do want, but what is your inner child needing or trying to say underneath that, I level underneath that, and usually it's, I feel rejected. I feel unloved. I don't feel important. I feel silly. I feel you don't love me. And that, just the energy that comes with those words, fully owning, basically the more vulnerable you are, the more scary it is to say, that's what you want to say, but the more vulnerable you are, the more you're you're, you're talking from the heart. And I don't think that another person can, can fail to feel that energy, which is very different to, I need this and you never do this. And I have to, I've asked you so many times that you have to do this or you're rejecting me. That energy is attacking. And we both did this for years. Well, I think that's what we were talking about earlier about who's in charge, who's who's like running the relationship. Is it the inner parent? Is it the unconscious needs? Or is it, are we talking consciously? 
Like if you can come together and say, okay, look, we've both got some challenges here. We've both got some baggage. We've both got some wounds. Let's work at it together to be better people and better parents and have a better relationship. Surely you're going to want to do that. Surely you're going to want to commit to that. You're going to do that when you've got alcohol. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> it's you too throw the easy. alcohol bomb in the mix. It, yeah, it's too easy. I think, I don't know whether it comes with But back to the point of men and women, right? You, a lot of women do this work first. Right? Yeah. A lot of women lead the way. And I think I think that's okay. I think that's normal. I think we see the potential and then we demand it of others, be that our friends, our partners, our children. So it's all it's all about the way that you communicate that. If you can communicate that from the heart and tell them, I see the potential, I love you, we could be this. I remember when we got together, I miss that part of you. All of that kind of language, that comes across in a very different way to you're not committed. Yeah, criticism, nagging, it's just not the way to get it done. But also I think men, I think men and women are obviously fundamentally different. And I think men, you know, it's the whole directions thing. It's the whole just like get my, get your head down. It'll be all right. I can sort it out. And also men are, tend to be a bit more focused on like, I don't know, it's like if I can sort this out, if we can earn more money, there'll be less stress. Or if I can sort this out over here, there'll be less stress over here. And I think, I think there's fear. There's fear. Women can go there. Women can talk about pain and relationships because we've been given permission to do so by the society in which we live. You guys haven't so much. So, mm. of course, you're going to go to, I need to earn more or get that promotion mm. or get us a better house. Externalizing the problem. Because that comes easier to a man it's much easier to fix something external than it is to go towards your pain and so many of my clients partners shut down they won't they won't talk about it so shutting down is a really big issue because what do you do what how, how do you luckily you never did that actually uh or I, i'm well, I did a bit. tenacious <laughs> i won't let something go but this is definitely something that comes up with women um not knowing how to react when they bring something up, perhaps from the heart, and they feel they're being vulnerable. I really want support with this, or could you help me with this? And then the partner will just blank them, shut down, say, don't be silly, you're being unreasonable, don't be so dramatic, you're making a mountain out of mohawk. How would you say that women can work with a partner that is doing that? I think well, there's a couple of things. I think it's the, it's the man's responsibility. First, I want to talk a little bit about why that happens. So I think for men, we don't automatically learn how to process our emotion. So our go-to is like repression. So when you repress emotion, it gets stored in your body. So you kind of, you've got a backlog. Many men are like full. They're stressed. They're so full, they're disconnected from their body. They're so full, they're anxious, they're stressed, they're overloaded, and all they can do is repress because that's all they know how to do it. Why do you think that's all they know? Because I think that's the the guidance and the role modelling that, that they got as children. From their... Probably from dads? families, from... Uh, Mothers my, and... From, mostly dads. Mm. Um, so it's a cultural thing. Society probably. and parental influence. Mm. And that's widely discussed. We kind of know that's that's the way it is. But when you are when you when you feel that way and somebody's asking for more, somebody's asking or like it feels like somebody's putting more emotion on to something that's already full. Or asking for something that you don't know how to access. Or you feel like if you do access those emotions, then you're going to get completely overwhelmed by like a volcano or a tidal wave of decades of repressed emotions. So, so there's no way of saying, so what do you do? I can't do this or this feels difficult. I think people shut down because that's the way they deal with big emotions. That's the way we are taught to deal with big emotions. So it feels like, oh, this is too big. I need to shut down. So how does a woman work with that? How would a, a, a mum or a partner work with that? 
I think it needs to be acknowledged that that's the situation by either the the woman or the man or you know independently owning that situation. See, I would I would actually call that a trauma response. So yes. I would call that yeah freeze. I go into fight. You to a certain degree would go into free. You would walk away. So we don't do this anymore, thank God, because you know that it triggers me when you walk away. And I know that I trigger you when I'm badgering you for an answer. Mm. But that was that was us playing out our trauma responses. I'd be like, don't walk away. I haven't finished talking. We haven't finished this discussion. I'd want it sorted before bed. I'd mm. want it all neat, tied up with a bow. Everyone said, sorry, it's all okay. And then I want to go to sleep. You were like, I'm full. I'm out. Of I here. can't discuss this anymore. I don't know how to handle the feelings I'm feeling. I'm done. And that would make me feel worthless and unimportant and not worthy of putting the effort. It felt like you were being lazy. I can't be bothered. I, this is not worth my time and my energy. Actually, that was a trauma response. You're going to freeze or flight. Yeah. So I've, I get this with my clients. Either it's the, the woman or the man, or it's one of the two partners that needs to leave and one partner that's like, no way, we're not done here. So I think what we acknowledge that, we acknowledge it, first of all. Say, I, you have to say, it. I find it really upsetting when you leave. It makes me feel worthless, blah, blah, blah. And I think most of the time, the people that are walking away don't realize that. They have no idea. And the people that are left in the room kind of stranded have no idea that the people leaving, it's not deliberate. It's literally like that's all they can do to get through. So talking about it really helps. I think talking about it helps, but that's like, it's almost like a mindset hack. It's almost like telling somebody to stay present when you're having a trauma response. It's good to know, but it's not going to allow you to change you your behavior, yeah. right? It, the 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 change in dynamic comes as a side effect of doing the work when you're able to stay when you're able to sit with the emotions of the other person but a woman's not going to go don't walk off go and do in a child work with a therapist now please well i think how's the ma how, what's your first intro to a man that shuts down i'm saying man it can be the other way around if your partner is the one that's shutting down I think if you're a man, it's about owning that situation and saying, I, I feel I've, I feel I'm overwhelmed. This situation's overwhelming me. So I'm not going to give you the response you, you're looking for, you need right now. Let's let's discuss it yeah. later. Let's discuss it at a different time. So ideally you're Again, that probably is never that. that's never gonna work, probably with a woman. <laughs> that's very mature. At that moment in time. But can you even get to the point where you can say that? This is what this is. This well, it depends. Takes time, right? This is not this. This podcast isn't about quick fixes. Where the bottom line is always do the work. Always do the deep, deep, painful, hard inner work to heal your inner child, which takes. The problem weeks. we had, and lots of people have, is that one person needs to be conscious in that in that conversation to get a different outcome. So if you're triggered because your stress from the day or the kids have triggered you or the messy house has triggered you and you're like, I'm triggered, I'm angry about this. Right, you, it's your fault, your problem. I need more support from you. I need this from you, right? And then the guy's like overwhelmed and he's triggered and he goes into shutdown. There's two kids in the conversation there. You're never going to find a solution there. Well, but that's why I say to my clients to do the work afterwards. I believe that every conflict is so useful for understanding and unpacking what was really going on. So even if you have an argument at the time, fine, let it spiral. You say things you don't mean. It's a disaster. Fine. But afterwards, once the charge has gone, once you've released that initial anger, resentment, frustration, which you can get out in your journal, journal it all out, be as mean as you can, get it out. When that's gone, then you can have a conversation about what was really going on on a deeper level. And that's where the work can happen so that you don't have the same circular argument. You might have a different argument next time, but at least you're one step closer to understanding each other because of that argument. So I think arguments are actually really useful. I think that's useful. a great point. I think, and I think you're right. Like that is the first step. The first step is you're not going to stop the behavior 
by trying to do it differently. But you can change the behavior by uh, reacting or recognizing what happened in the uh, in the past. So, okay, we we were triggered last night. Yeah, yeah we were we were both triggered last night. Yeah, so then back. you do your work. I do my work. And the work being, then, what was what was my inner child yeah, what feeling? What was I really so feeling? You start off by saying, okay, what did I feel? I felt angry. I felt belittled. I felt betrayed. Okay, what did you feel underneath that? What did your inner child feel when you felt belittled, betrayed, rejected? And then, like I've said before, it's usually unloved, unworthy. Well, it might be for the man, I felt criticized. I felt like you were, or, or I actually felt overwhelmed. I couldn't process the emotion. Or I felt like you were criticizing me. I felt uh, like you were judging me. I felt like you were demanding too much of me, which may be a wound. So that all may that's be... That's the surface level. No, that may be the wound. In a child. That may be the wound. But you can't say to someone, I felt you were being demanding. That's like, you got it wrong. No, so you're I, owning I felt, that. I felt... I felt like, uh, yeah, I felt like you were being demanding. Yeah, but that I'm not made saying you feel you're, you're accusing you of that. That's how it comes across. Yeah, but the conversation is not between me and you. The conversation is acknowledgement of how my inner child felt. I think you should then go down a level and say, I felt unloved. Well, probably all comes. I down felt, to well, what it is, is I felt incapable, actually. If you're saying you were demanding too much, what you're really saying is I felt incapable. Or you felt, I felt, I felt like you were criticizing me, which is rejecting me. Yes, you always go down. It's never what the other person did to you because that's accusing. That can be accusing and you go into defense, attacking in defense. So that's the surface level. But then underneath that level is rejection, unimportant. Because it goes back to parent. It's not you were criticizing me. It's I perceived what you're saying as criticism because my mum used to criticize me. And when she used to say that, I used to feel rejected. Yeah. So by you saying that at that point in time, my inner child was feeling rejected. And that's why I, that's why I shut down. So c- conflict is a really good, actually constructive step in terms of getting to know the wounds that you come to this relationship with. So, yeah, you're saying conflict is uh, quite normal and actually it can be a tool if you're willing to use it to do the repair. Absolutely. And commitment is one of the common conflicts which come up in relationship that perhaps hasn't come up before, because why would it? You're only going to be accused of not committing by someone that you've already entered into quite a vulnerable connected relationship with so it's often a tricky one to navigate because you haven't necessarily navigated it since you were a child right it, yeah. it's it's really bringing up old childhood stuff because if you don't like a job you leave if you don't like a house you move if you don't like a country you move you never actually have to really look at your stuff until you have children who shine a light on them or you have a partner that you've been vulnerable enough to show your true self to and then if they don't perform in the way your inner child wants them to that can be really really triggering really upsetting really rejecting the other thing i want to say about commitment is i think the commitment thing is interesting because it can be a reflection or a side effect of all the other wounds because in order for you to feel that I'm committed, you have to feel that I'm present, right? You have to feel that I'm here with you. And a lot of people, a lot of my clients are not embodied, even if they're physically with their partners and they're like, yeah, I'm here. What are we doing today? Yeah, let's go. Let's take the kids. Really, they're either their minds at work or they're not connected to their body at all. So a symptom of any childhood wounding or trauma is repressed emotion and therefore disconnection from body so just lack of presence and lack of embodiment Mm. so that's that's a big thing that we get is the women are not feeling the commitment so it's not necessarily something that you do it's a energetic exchange like i'm here for you i'm present you need to be embodied 
to be present and be committed. And your inner child is not going to be embodied if the source of her pain is still in her body because it's unprocessed. So this is a, you know, it's all it all points back to attachment trauma, understanding that this isn't a bad thing. This is a kind of a part of growing up, right? All of our parents had limitations. We have limitations. We have flaws. You are not going to be able to show up for your child, especially if you have more than one, in exactly the way that they need. It's literally impossible because you're not them. You don't know what it is that they fully need. So attachment trauma is small t trauma. It's something that you can absolutely heal. Even if you didn't have secure attachment as a child, you can create secure attachment and that comes from the inner parent. So I think... What we're saying, really, bottom line is, most people have this. We've given you a couple of examples of how this might show up in your relationship. We're going to go and talk a lot more about how this might show up in your parenting or in life, for example, at work or with friends, with your parents. And always trying to give you practical examples of how it's affected us and how we've overcome it and the tools and tricks that you can use in addition to inner child healing to help you to show up as the mum, the dad, the partner, the person that you want to be. Yeah, uh, my my view is very similar to that. I think that, back to the original point about divorce, I think if we presume that people get together because of their unconscious wounding, which I think is is true, that unconscious wounding is going to come up to be processed in the course of a relationship together, a long-term relationship with the stress of kids and the stress of life. You've got a choice. You either don't process it and blame the other person, and that's going to lead to distance and dysfunction and probably divorce, right, and further trauma. Or you choose to heal it, to take individual responsibility and heal the trauma so you can come back together and evolve together. And that's that's natural. That's what a marriage is. That's what a relationship is. Um, so if you are experiencing any of this any of this stuff that we're talked to that we're talking about, then my message is that it's natural, it's okay, and actually it's just a challenge for you to work together as a couple. And hopefully we can provide some value in this, in these discussions, in this podcast. Yeah. So I hope you enjoyed listening to that. I hope it was helpful. We work with individuals and couples. So please reach out if you have any other topics that you want us to cover. We would love to hear from you. And obviously we're here to support you through any challenges that you're experiencing, either as a parent, as a partner or in life. Because let's face it, the inner child shows up everywhere. (laughs) She's... She's not, you can't leave her at home. (laughs) If what we discussed was helpful, please subscribe and leave us a five-star review. For more of the same, check out my social media, The Inner Child Healing Expert, or to work with me, go to LaviniaBrown.com. You can find me on AndrewLynn.net or Life Coach for Dads on Instagram. We work with both individuals and couples. If there are any topics you'd like us to cover, please reach out. Thanks for listening.